Hello, I'm Andy Coulson, a former newspaper editor, Downing Street Director of Communications and one-time inmate of HMP Belmarsh. Welcome to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast where we aim to guide you towards a more resilient approach to life and whatever it might throw at you. On this podcast, you'll hear from the embattled, shamed, courageous, ruined, damaged, resilient, unlucky and lucky survivors of crisis. Their stories, I hope you'll agree, are as useful as they are compelling. My guest today is the former Foreign Secretary, Lord Haig of Richmond, William Haig. As someone who has been in the room as the decision maker at so many moments of political drama, William has an incredibly valuable voice to add to this conversation that we're having about crisis. From his challenging time as Conservative Party leader, the wilderness years out of frontline politics, the four he then spent as Foreign Secretary and now as a businessman and a rather brilliant commentator, Uh, William has a pretty unique perspective on what makes a crisis and how those in public life should approach managing them. Threaded throughout our discussion on Ukraine, Brexit, political resignations and why being Prime Minister is absolutely not the route to happiness, uh, William gives us the Hague formula for crisis management. It is, perhaps as you might expect, pretty no-nonsense. William thinks his keep calm, keep perspective approach is out of kilter with the modern world of instant decision making and instant judgments. I suspect after listening to him here, you'll think like me, that it's exactly what the bonkers world of politics needs right now. William and I uh, worked quite closely together more than a decade ago. And this conversation also reminded me just how reasonable a bloke he is. God knows we could do with a bit of that. Or maybe I'm just getting old. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this conversation and thanks so much for listening. Lord Haig, William, a warm welcome to Crisis What Crisis. How are you, sir? Uh, Thank you very much, Andy. Yeah, uh, great pleasure and uh, very good to talk to you again. It's good to see you. Um, William, you've had a um, a front row seat uh, to so many crises over the years during your career. I wonder where on a scale of sort of one to 10, would you place us right now from a geopolitical perspective? How concerned are you with the big picture, primarily in Ukraine, but but, but also elsewhere? I'm very concerned. You know, we're on a scale of uh, seven or eight out of 10, historically speaking, uh, I would say. I mean, and this is certainly the the biggest period of crisis. in, in, for the, in the lifetimes of most of us alive today. Um, and particularly when you add so many things together, when you add the, the COVID crisis we've been through, the Ukraine crisis we're living through now, then the, there's a food crisis on top of that, uh, all the gathering problems in relations between the United States and China. Now, this is more of a historical norm, of course, to be in a period where there are a lot of crisis. We've, we've been through the illusion that history had ended and that um, problems in the world have been largely abolished uh, the last 20 or 30 years. So that's why I say it's a seven or eight. It's not a 10. You know, people, previous Mm -hmm. generations lived through the First World War, the Second World War. Um, Those are far bigger crises than anything we've experienced so far. Um, But it is extremely concerning because we do lack internationally the mechanisms now to, uh, to sort these things out. And that's why they can so easily, they can all get worse. Um, and, and it's a very concerning time. Were you back behind that rather splendid desk of yours in the Foreign Office? How, how, would, how would you be prioritising the sort of crisis workload right now? Well, Ukraine would be right at the top of the list because it is, um, it's affecting so many other things. You know, I just mentioned food security, Obviously, the world's biggest wheat producer invading the world's fifth biggest wheat producer um, is a major contributor to the to a crisis of food supply and security in the world. Um, it's also the Ukraine war could easily turn into a wider conflict. Uh, nobody wants it to, but it is the sort of thing that that could do so, and it paralyzes global institutions. Can anybody imagine the G20 functioning usefully now as a global organization? Remember how in the, in the global financial crisis in 2008-9, the G20 was the vital 
instrument of uh, international coordination. Well, the G20, the, the United States president won't even sit down at the same table now as the president of Russia. Um, and so um, that can't function. So the, the Ukraine war has got to be top of the list because it is the root of so many other things. Um, now, that's, that, that doesn't mean uh, you're asking about what you do with them sitting behind the desk at the foreign office. Of course, what you don't do is decide you're working on one thing behind that desk at the foreign office. You actually have to deal with 50 or 100 things every day mm -hmm. and work on the long-term thing. And I, I think the, um, this whole issue of relations with China, between China and the West, is where we have to see the next big crisis coming and do what we can to avert it. You know, that is the work of the coming years. And you know, in, in the Foreign Office, of course, you don't you don't work in a vacuum. You would be pretty frustrated, I imagine, by matters closer to home, if I can put it that way, that quite understandably could kind of get in the way, don't they, of the big international issues, the ability to really see in the end it's time, isn't it, of, of to be able to do your job, think and and strategize. Um yeah, that's one of the issues. Yeah. That's one of the issues of political crisis management, isn't it? That those domestic issues just keep getting in the way. Well, it is. Uh, that is normal policy. I mean, it does seem absurd, doesn't it? That the uh, that we have Sri Lanka is in anarchy, for instance, an important mm. country to the, uh, an important friendly country to this country, where many British people have many personal and, and business connections, and uh, we're not spending much time. Our media aren't spending much time on that because we're all really, really busy with which party leader went to a party, you know, should have had a fixed penalty notice through a police analysis that nobody can understand from the outside of how they're deciding yes. who to find and not to find. We're all really preoccupied with that. However, you know, that is the, um, that's what, that's the nature of democratic politics. And um, if, if you're, if, if you're behind the desk as foreign secretary, you try to get on with things and hope that somebody like you in your old role is sorting all that out uh, so that you can get on with handling the, um, the global, the sort of intergalactic stuff, uh, the global stuff. But yeah, it is. Uh, it's a distract. And it's in government. There is only so much bandwidth. Uh, as you know, government's no different from any other organization that the people at the top only have so many hours in the day where they can think about things. And the, the main reason usually they make what seems afterwards to be a terrible mistake on something is that they did it in a hurry, that they were really concentrating on something else. Um, and then something just happened in a great rush where there wasn't time to question the assumptions. So mm. um, it's really important. Sorry, I'm going on a little bit here, but it's really important that that things like the national security machine we set up in 2010, as you will recall, the national security yes. council. Um, and we really took the time and trouble, whatever else was going on, to sit in the national security council and consider together um, both short-term and long-term questions of national security. It, my impression is that in the Ukraine crisis, that sort of machinery is working pretty well in British government, but that in the Afghanistan, in, in the debacle of the uh, pullout from Kabul last year, that it didn't work well, that, that because it yes. was August, really, it wasn't working hmm. uh, well. And That's so interesting. I, I think yeah. the challenge in government is to make sure that whatever, whatever the distractions, whatever's happening in domestic politics, that sort of machinery, get, you get the military chiefs, the intelligence chiefs, the, the key secretaries of state and the prime minister, and you make sure you're spending that hour or two hours thinking about those big international issues. Because otherwise, there is a, a risk of making a serious mistake. That's interesting. You, often on this podcast, we the, the kind of crisis you, you know we you, you work out the obvious. It's essentially a bunch of people in a room trying to work their way through a problem. I mean, when, when you when you've been in that room, um, William, just just give us a sense of what's going on in 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 your head. What's the what's the William Hague sort of crisis management model? You, you know, you've had to deal with some very kind of gnarly issues over the years. What what sort of a approach do you take when you walk into the room as the decision maker? 
Well, the ideal approach, and I'm not saying we all, including me, always reach this ideal, is to be very calm, obviously, objective, and not have too many ingoing assumptions. Now, I suppose what I really think of when you ask that question is those occasions uh, where, which we handle very carefully in this country under different governments, where British national has been taken hostage uh, overseas. And you have to decide, might be the Prime Minister, might be the Foreign Secretary, in my, uh, I was involved in three of these things, where we have to, had to decide whether to use lethal force to rescue a British national, whether to send a military, a special forces operation to rescue them. Of course, you only get to that point if you think their life is in danger. You're not going to launch a military rescue if there's some likely to be another way of getting them out, of negotiating them out or whatever. But um, if things get really difficult and you think there may be no alternative, then you have to weigh that up. And I remember those meetings and thinking what that hostage wants to know is that the person sitting in the chair at that meeting is really objective, is, is not preoccupied with something else in the way you were mm -hmm. just asking about, you know, is not an alcoholic, is not a um, having their own mental health crisis. You know, they've got to be really somebody who will coolly, objectively decide the best chance of bringing this person out alive after listening to special forces leaders, you know, looking at satellite photos, uh, taking account of advice on the local geography and everything, that uh, after all of that, that, that person in the chair is going to coolly decide something that might end their life or it might rescue them. Um, so um, you've got to be like that. You, you have to sort of think who does, what sort of person does that hostage need me to mm. be? And I think yes. that isn't a bad guiding um, thought of how to conduct yourself. Very good. We found ourselves in the room, William, a few times when crisis loomed. Um, I remember well the night in September 2008 when we were at a conference in Birmingham, I think, when the world began to, uh, to collapse in around our ears, um, the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Um, we were stood watching TV, I remember, not quite sure what to do in the first instance. And in that room, David's, uh, David Cameron's hotel suite, you were the absolute personification of calm. Um, I remember passing on the message that, um, that there were some actually pretty heavy hitters uh, in the media world who were gathered downstairs who all thought that we should cancel conference. I don't know if you remember and head back to London immediately. And I remember you were the first to say, no, we shouldn't do that. We should do the exact opposite. We should double down. You should give us, you should break, you know, with tradition and give a speech tomorrow. It was, this is right at the beginning of a conference. So normally David's speech would be much later in the week. We should deliver a speech tomorrow specifically on this issue and get on with it and show that we can get on with it. And it worked brilliantly. Right. Well, I, don't, I can't claim to always react well to a crisis, but it's certainly, being calm is a good start. And if I, I did yeah. learn later on when I became foreign secretary, there were occasions when um, the officials would all rush into the room saying, uh, oh, foreign secretary, something terrible has happened. And, and uh, you know, we need to send a plane immediately to, over there. And, uh, you know, we need to recall our ambassador from that country. So, uh, and I actually I got into the habit of saying, right, thank you very much. Come back in and go and sit down in one hour. Come back. Um, with your reflections on what we should do about the situation, provided there was nobody's life in danger in that hour. The, um, you know, and just everybody calm down and think about it and then come back. And that proved mm -hmm. to be quite a good And of course, if you keep saying that when these things happen, they learn after a couple of years that before they rush into the room, they should sit down and calmly reflect. Um, and um, I, I suppose I have a real aversion to um, sort of, uh, I suppose it's a kind of gesture politics. It, sometimes the trouble is it's what the media expect, that you, that you, you, you go into a flap, you know, that you cancel things, that you rush back from wherever, even though it doesn't make the slightest difference in the world of modern digital communication where you're actually sitting often. 
They want to see somebody rush off a plane and, you know, uh, run down Downing Street and look panic-stricken. And maybe that means mm -hmm. I'm not really suited to the modern media age because I would rather say, no, everybody just calm down, think about it. Um, don't pander to the idea there's always a crisis because sometimes we make it worse by um, getting into a cricket, getting into the wrong yeah. state. You know, it goes back to what I was saying about how you handle a hostage rescue. The main thing is to be cool and detached and utterly objective. And um, I think we sometimes we're, we're we're kind of pressured by the rat, the great speed of social media these days to um, and twenty four hour news coverage. So it's have to show we've got ourselves into a state um, mm. and we're rushing around and we go, you know, we can only just cope. Well, what about showing that we're not in a state, that we take things in our stride, that we, uh, that we can cope, um, that we're going to keep calm? That somehow isn't what people expect of you now. I think this is what exactly. we need to correct in the public psychology of how you handle a crisis. I could not agree more. I'd love to talk about that a bit more in a, in a, in a moment or two. I remember, though, another moment um, of shared crisis, uh, another conference. It was all, conference was always sort of cock up and crisis, I seem to remember. Uh, in, two, in 2007, down in the polls, backs against the wall, do or die week in Blackpool, if you remember. And the first day of conference and the microphones failed. Total sort of humiliation in front of the, in front of the media. Uh, how can you trust this lot to run the country if they can't work a mic, you know? And, and you were due on stage and you were delayed because of that technical failure for, 40, for 45 minutes or an hour or so. And then you came on stage, William, and you absolutely knocked it for six. Um, I think your opening line was something about Prescott being spotted uh, backstage, pulling out the plugs or something. I can't remember what it was, but it was just... I can't remember. It was, a, it was, a, it was an absolute barnstormer. Uh, and the importance of humour, really, is what struck me at that moment in times of crisis. It's a very, very useful tool, isn't it? Yes, it is. And again, because of, you can only come up with humour. I think it is linked to the points we were just discussing, because um, humour comes out of seeing things in perspective and mm -hmm. um, of, of being able to see another side to an, an argument and of being relatively calm. Um, and so, yes, humor, if appropriate, because I mean, it's not humorous, uh, it's not appropriate to be humorous if um, a war's just starting. Um, but if it's something less serious than that, like the microphones have failed and the party's under pressure in the polls, then humor is appropriate. And um, they have always think of some of the greatest leaders in history, you know, of Churchill or Reagan and uh, how they would use humor to diffuse a situation, even in very serious situations. Um, yes. And, um, you know, so, so I think there is, a, there is an important role for that. Um, and I had forgotten about that. I, I remember the, uh, the 2007 conference, I've forgotten about the microphones failing, but the, this was when uh, we all thought Gordon Brown, new prime minister, was about to have a general election, and he got a sudden surge, right. a honeymoon popularity. It even had Margaret Thatcher right. around to Downing Street to show that he was maybe a Tory exactly. after all. Uh, yes. And, and uh, uh, we had to really turn around the national sentiment in a week, so that um, if he did call an election, he wouldn't win it, and then if he didn't call an election, he was running away from it. Um, yes. And, and um, so there we had to. You know, that, that, there's being calm is very important, but there's also out of calmness producing energy and um, decisiveness and action. And what we did achieve that week was um, from me giving the opening, one of the opening speeches at the conference, as you say, to George Osborne the next day, gave a great speech about um, inheritance tax, inheritance tax. And, and energizing the conservative tax agenda. Then David Cameron gave one of his great um one of his noteless speeches, you know, a, 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 a right. real rallying yeah. speech at the end of the week. And, and within one week, we went from being behind in the polls to level or ahead in the polls. I can't remember the mm. numbers. Um, so this is how I, I don't want to be, uh, mis you know, anyone to misinterpret me what I'm saying about keeping calm. You keep calm, but you produce from that clear, you know, a clear, united 
strategy and uh, and energy and um, that's what we did in that particular conference week so we went from uh, I remember doing interviews in that week where it was like who was the odds on success of David Cameron because he was toast and uh, you know they were all writing him off in the media by the end of the week he was the likely next prime minister which indeed he turned out to be exactly right and that calmness that you describe it kind of gives you the room doesn't it to make the to take the calculated risks, and that's essentially, that's essentially what he did. I think with that with that speech is that we, we sort of created the right environment for him to then actually you know roll the dice in a pretty spectacular way. Um, yes, um, but with great, yes. but with great but you success. Have to, you know, you have to. Uh, it's the old. You have to see the whites of their eyes. You have to mm. um, not open fire at the first thing you see. Um, and um, but then make sure that as the enemy advances, you're really ready for them. Uh, yes. And um, I, th- I think that's what we were doing there. And this, just to, I'm, I'm uh, going back to my previous point in a way, in the age of social media and Twitter and so on, there's a real premium on reacting within minutes to something of saying something before somebody else of uh, that's meant to be how you show your grip on the situation. But um, mm-hmm. it, the instant reaction isn't always the best. It's certainly not the best informed. Uh, and uh, I think that is one of the ways in which the expectations of public figures now don't help them to deal with a crisis. Yeah. And it's not just about instant reaction, is it? It's also instant judgment. Um, that 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 makes it very very difficult to um, uh, to sort of you know pause and consider uh, to sort of absorb information to then make the right decision in the way that you described yeah. earlier. There's very very little room for that now. There's very little. We're I going get... back to you know primeval instinct, but we are programmed as creatures for very good evolutionary reasons to make instant. Judgments, you know, that woolly mammoth is too big for me to do anything but run, you know, or that one, I am now in a position to throw this spear at the and the instant judgment is crucial to survival. However, that was when we were hunter gatherers, and um, now we have we did not evolve to judge a situation where even this multi-dimensional thing of the domestic politics, the foreign politics, the military consequences, you're a nuclear power, you know, the, the, that was not what we evolved. To be. We haven't caught up with that. Our intelligence hasn't caught up with that. Let's be, let, you know, let's be humble as humans. And um, mm. that means you have to stop and think a bit more. And, um, you know, uh, and make sure these, these 10 or 20 different things you need to consider, which are more than you can hold in your head at one time, that you've taken stock of all of that. So um, we, we tend to think we are, you know, we can make an instant judgment when actually we shouldn't. Uh, Brexit, William, is that, is that an example of where, uh, you know, you, you, you talked about kind of having we talked in the, in the context of 2007 of having found the room somehow to to sort of take a to take a calmer decision was Bre- was was brexit an example of where the party the leadership sort of failed to do that i mean war aside uh, the biggest political crisis you've been involved with would you say well is do we call that a crisis or is it just a long uh, slow moving uh you know, crash uh, of some sort. Mm. Um, well, it's not a point of crisis, is it? It's something that's it's a process that's happened over um, 10 years or so, really, frankly. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. It's had its moments of crisis, like over the, uh, you know, the various uh, dramatic votes in the House of Commons on Theresa May's plans and then Boris Johnson coming to power and so on. And did we come to the wrong, I mean, uh, you know, we decided over quite a long period that we would propose a referendum uh, through between 2011 and 2013. We decided the Conservative Party's position should be to have a referendum. Now, of course, those of us who were um, thinking of that saw it as a way to solve the problem, to, to, to deal with the problem permanently. 
rather than just none of us discussing it, were actually in favor of pulling out of the EU. Um, mm. uh, we knew we were taking a risk, but we, we were running out of other options to deal with the buildup of um, discontent after um, so much immigration to the UK from Eastern European countries, the Lisbon Treaty being passed without any democratic uh, consent, something we were strongly opposed to, but they, once that went through, um, you know, we, we were running out of options to show that there was some democratic accountability over this whole European project. Um, mm. So I'm not sure, I, I think um, it probably knowing what we know now, we would have tried to hold out more against having a referendum. Uh, the thing we underestimated was how much politics was changing. Um, and um, people, we, we were still assuming back in 2012 that fundamentally people voted in their economic self-interest, uh, or, yes. or most people did. Uh, enough people did in a general election or a referendum for that to be the decisive factor. But in the interval between proposing a referendum, 2012, 2013, and having a referendum, 2016, that changed quite a bit. <clears throat> but, you know, culture and migration became bigger factors in politics. And people stopped voting in what was necessarily their best economic interest. And that was what we didn't spot. So I suppose yes. there's another important point about a crisis. If you're taking long-term decisions, it's very hard to work out what the um, how the basic um, underlying forces are going to change between what you're thinking now and what the eventual outcome is going to be years later. Yes, and and the other issue, I suppose. I mean, you were on the inside; I was on the outside by then. But you know, the party had just won an election that he thought it would lose. David just won an election that he thought he would lose, which ra which rather pointed towards your thesis being correct rather than incorrect. Yes, um, exactly, exactly. I think we always thought that um, in the end, you know, 55 to 60 percent of people in Britain would vote in what um, a consensus would say was their best, their direct best interest. So um, yeah. this is a new political world where they don't do that. But we've seen the same thing in the United States and, and many other countries that um, people disagree with, with the old political analysis. So they're entitled to, they're free to do so, but they... They reject that old analysis. We'll be right back after this. As regular listeners know, Crisis What Crisis is brought to you with a little help from Mindstream, a personal well-being music company designed to create those calmer moments in our hectic lives. Mindstream can really help put you back on track and guide you towards the mindfulness that we all need to function more effectively. And I can tell you from personal experience that it really works. Mindstream Music is cleverly designed to help regulate your body's response to stressful situations by slowing your heartbeat and guiding you towards that more calmer state. They also have playlists to stimulate your brain, helping to keep you focused and engaged for longer periods of time. Getting your mindset right is the absolute key when you're navigating a crisis or if you're just struggling with day-to-day -day pressures. You'll find them at mindstream.com. That's mind with a Y. Uh, they're also on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, wherever you download your music from. So take back some control and consider making a Mindstream playlist one of your crisis cures. I don't think you'll regret it. And now back to William Haig. And what about the impact of political crisis? Was David, which invariably ends with a resignation, was David right to um, was David right to resign? I, I mean, I, I, I took the view whenever I offered it, tumbleweed would come through the room. I was, I, th I think, um, pretty alone in this view. I didn't think he should resign. Um, I, I thought, I oh, thought he should have stuck losing, it out. No, I think on losing, um, I think if a national leader loses a national referendum. You've got very little option but to resign. And, you know, this is what um, even um, President de Gaulle, an incredibly powerful leader, was brought down by a referendum, a referendum on local government in, uh, in France. Mm. Because the, the trouble is, if you try to stay in power, you're much more vulnerable. Instead of being securely in office, you know, you've got part of your party that then says, 
oh no, really, uh, he should have gone. He hasn't got the legitimacy to take this forward now. And so you're always having to fight that battle as well as try to govern. Um, and the second problem is that if you stay in office after a defeat like that, you then have to implement something you don't believe in. And um, that uh, something on such a scale, something so fundamental that you don't believe in, it's not a detail, it's not just a compromise, you, you know, it's something you really don't believe in. And um, mm. that's quite hard as a, at the top of politics. Of course, a junior minister often has to implement something they don't really mm. believe in because they take their orders from them, they don't want to rock the boat. But if you're the actual party leader, or something close to it, you do need to authentically believe in what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can absolutely see that. But, and I, nor do I argue, by the way, that if he'd stayed, that it would have ended well. I suspect it probably would have ended badly. But I think it would have been a better exit, strangely. Because I think that the... There's no, for, for me, which is an overly simplistic point, is that where in the job description of prime minister does it say that when, you know, when the public, when you ask a question and the public disagree with you, you have to leave? You know, I, 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 just, I just felt it would have been a better exit if it, because mm-hmm. the question wasn't really about him, was it? Uh, no, uh, it wasn't, it no. Wasn't, man, it, wasn't, no. It, wasn't, it wasn't about him at all. He delivered, this is one of the issues with referendums. You remember that... Um, Prime Minister Renzi of Italy about that time had a referendum on constitutional reform. And he said he would resign if he lost it, for the reasons I was just giving earlier. But then uh, people said, OK, we need to vote against him to get rid of it. You know, so it introduced a new uh, factor mm. into the referendum. David avoided doing that because he didn't want to become an issue in the referendum. He wanted to to be focused on the EU. Then people were shocked that he resigned. Um, but you know, I, I think probably had he stayed in office and tried to, we would have had a better um, form of Brexit. Uh, however, the Conservative Party would have, as it as it just almost did anyway, torn itself to pieces, saying the yes, reason he's making these compromises. You know, let's say he had. Um, Signed us up to the European Economic Area instead, outside the EU, but still with a lot of close economic cooperation with the, uh, I don't know whether he would have done that, but th- that would have been mm-hmm. a, a perfectly good middle ground way of doing Brexit. Um, half the Conservative Party would have said, well, he's not a true believer, so he's not delivering real Brexit. And um, now we have yeah. to get rid of him. So you see, he would have come straight back round to having a constant crisis over his leadership it would have been terribly it would have been terribly difficult and and i think a, a, a pretty nightmarish role for him but i think that the you know the the, the 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 kind of divisions that you've just described wouldn't necessarily have been reflected in the public and i think he david was always so good at being able to get above the politics and talk directly to people but uh, uh i'm sure i'm sure you're right um, doesn't resigning, though, it, it sort of exacerbate generally one of the problems we have in politics? You know, Boris has shown, uh, uh, and I should say, uh, as we speak, that not resigning is rather a good strategy. Um, we had uh, we had Kim Darrock on the on the podcast not long ago. Uh, you felt, I remember, that he shouldn't have resigned. Uh, you said it was an unambiguously bad thing to have done, uh, that it was a win for Trump. Um, so where does uh, where does where does where do you sit on the on the on the, on the kind of you know on the impact of resignations which have become so fashionable now? <laughs> well, that's that's a fascinating question, and of course there are no hard and there can't be any hard and fast rules about this. All these situations are different. It depends a lot on your own personality because. Um, you know, it, it, to not resign, you have to really be hungry to carry on. And if you're not hungry, it's well, often it's better to get out. You know, so the uh, some of that is just within each individual, and you can't make a rule about it. Um, and um, some of it has to come from a uh, a, 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 a self aware weighing up of whether you can still do the job 
effectively. Mm. And now some politicians mm. don't resign or uh, other people in these situations because they lack self-awareness, you know, because they think they can get out of anything. Um, I felt for when I, re I resigned as leader of the opposition the day after the general election in 2001, um, because I thought, well, you know, trying to be self-aware, trying to um, uh, take note of what people thought here in a general election. Democracy functions better if you have a leader of the opposition who people can see as the next prime minister. But once you've lost heavily in a general election, they won't see you like that. So, you know, much uh, there were people around me saying, oh, don't resign. We don't know who the next leader is going to be. It's a bit, then you think, no, no, actually, just be self aware. We can't, I mm. can't credibly do this. So I'm waffling slightly, but you, these are all factors, uh, I think, in a resignation. And then, so does it help the overall situation? to resign is a question. And does it, is it proportionate? Um, you, know, uh, you know, we've just had a case, for instance, where the Chancellor of the Exchequer got a fine and the opposition said he should resign. He got a fine basically for showing up on time to a meeting in the cabinet room where somebody mm. produced cake and he didn't walk out. So mm. now, is that actually something, is it right? For the Chancellor of the Exchequer, at a moment of great economic uncertainty, to quit mm -hmm. over that. Um, there may be lots of other things that chancellors and senior ministers can quit over. I think <laughs> not. That the, so you have to you have to also see it in perspective. Does it is it a big enough problem rather than everybody just screaming at you? Is it a big mm -hmm. enough problem to really warrant resignation? Well, losing a general election is, losing a referendum is, losing a war is. Um, you know, turning up on time to a meeting probably isn't. Uh, yes. so, <laughs> <laughs> but we both know that that conversation would have happened, right? <laughs> there were people in a room with him trying to work through whether or not he should or shouldn't resign over that. Uh, there, there, there we are. And do you think, William? Um, just talking about 2001, do you think, do you ever think what might have been if you'd become leader of the party a decade later? I, while I think a little bit, I only sort of muse on that. I, I, um, I'm, so, I'm a very lucky person. I'm so happy with the way life has turned out um, that um, I wouldn't actually turn the clock back and change it. You know, the... Um, uh, I can fully see now. I could, in fact, I could see not long after I became leader of the Conservative Party in 1997 that I'd done it at the wrong time. If my main objective in life was to be prime minister, then it was definitely a mistake to stand for election just when the most popular government in modern history had come in with an extraordinary piece of work as the leader of the Labour Party, Tony Blair, <laughs> who really had it in him to uh, be in power for a long time. Now, that was definitely yeah. a career yeah. mistake if the objective yeah. of my life was... You're all, you're all right. I'll come back in a decade. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the on the other hand, you know, I really can't... Uh, Complain. I, I, I continue to have a very fulfilling career. I went on to, um, because I didn't succeed in that, that opened me up to writing books, to going back into business, to learning to play the piano, to, you know, enjoying life in so many other ways. Uh, to be I, seem to remember, I seem to remember a rather excellent column in the News of the World, William. Uh, what, exactly. Somebody <laughs> got me into writing newspaper columns against my initial great reluctance, you did, in the news of the world. And I'm still, here I am, all these years later, still writing columns uh, and really enjoy it. I, I find I will, I will soon have been a newspaper columnist longer than I ever served in a government. So, uh, you know, what am what is my profession? And um, so all of these things opened up. And um, I don't, and therefore, I don't look back and say, oh, what a, you know, this was the disaster. Uh, in my in personally in my life, and um, mm. I also since I've known everybody who's been prime minister in a recent decade uh, reasonably well, 
you know, it, I, I don't labor, I don't live under the delusion that becoming prime minister is the route to personal happiness and uh, contentment because yes. um, um, most ex prime ministers are quite troubled in some ways or, you know, or have never got over uh, not being prime minister. Or, uh, yes. They, they, it depends on the personality. There are a couple of very well balanced personalities in there. Um, but um, it's not as if becoming prime minister is the way to uh, derive great satisfaction in life. You have a, a natural resilience and, uh, and an ability to kind of reinvent. Um, where, where, does that, where does that come from? Is it nature or nurture? Combination of both? Ooh, um, I have no idea. I, 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 it must be, I don't know. It's a combination of both. I was um, brought up in a family that was very matter of fact, whether, uh, you know, uh, where um, uh, I thought my, my mother and father had a very good approach to, you know, you get lots of knocks in life, you pick yourself up and, you know, we're not going to spend a lot of time sympathizing with you if you're going to scream your head off. And uh, it, it was a bit like that, uh, sort of loving family, but not, you know, you had to look after yourself a bit. And with three mm-hmm. older sisters, where well, you really had to look after yourself a bit. Uh, so maybe some resilience comes from, and small business value is a, with a family business. It was a self-reliant kind of um, atmosphere. But who knows? I think a lot of these things are hardwired uh, into you. And then you also learn resilience from um, the ups and downs of whatever career you go into. Um, I always tell people, I'm, I mentor young people about going into politics and I advise various of my old colleagues in the cabinet and I'm always saying, it is a roller coaster, you know, and you almost have to learn to enjoy the down bits when everybody's screaming. Because uh, it will go up, in most cases, if you hang on, it will go up again. It's hard to believe at the time, but just hang on, there, hang on in there. Yes, uh, yes. And, um, and get busy, it seems to be. You know, there is no yeah. career where it just goes up. And uh, that's not, you know, the greatest figures in history did not have that experience. You know, Margaret Thatcher, Winston Churchill, they, they had ups and downs. So who do you think you are that you're just going to go up all the time? And um, I try to explain that to them. So expectations are you're going to have to be resilient. Sorry, I, I talked over you there, Andy. No, I, 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 was, I, I was just going to say that the other aspect of it, though, is not just to accept that there are going to be downs, but to put the downs to work. That's what you've always done, whether it's a, whether it's a, you know, a, a biography or, or whether it's, a, you know, your columns or, you know, just kind of reinventing yourself in some form, as well as the sort of business life in the background. It work seems to be very important for you in terms of getting through those during the course of your career, getting through yeah. those, through those, yeah. those kind of quieter moments. Well, I, you know what I think? I think the most important thing is, is not to be a victim, you know, not mm. to think you are the entire, you are the victim of circumstances and conspiracies and uh, everybody's out to get you. It, it can often feel like everybody is out to get you. But um, if you think that way, you end up too sorry for yourself to pick yourself up again. You have to remember that you have agency, that you don't need to be a victim, that the, uh, you know, that there are, there are definitely things you can do to change your situation. It, it would be very unusual. Like you'd have to be a, you know, a prisoner on death row to uh, not to be able to do anything to change your situation. Uh, and, and so, you know, in vast majority of circumstances, you can do something about it. And I think that is a very, that, that's a key part of resilience. It's the fact that you, um, that you are so comfortable in your skin now, will you, that you are clearly so uh, content. Um, it's that fact, really, that, that I suspect makes a lot of people probably listening to this podcast 
rather wish you were back in politics. But that's exactly, <laughs> it's, the, it's the fact that you don't want to yeah. uh, really go back there that makes you the person who should. I mean, that's one of the problems we've got with politics, isn't it? Is, 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 that, is that those who've kind of reached that, you know, perspective and clarity of thought that you now have are exactly the people that we need, that we need in politics. <laughs> Well, that's nice of you to say so. I'm sure if, uh, but I am absolutely not going back into um, politics. But the, uh, but remember, I've in a way, I've already left and been back once. You know, uh, exactly. Yeah. Parliament, but I did. You left the news of the world, William, to go back to politics. I, even, I mean, what I are you did, thinking? I did, and that was a I read, um, <laughs> that cost me a lot uh, to leave the world <laughs> and become shadow foreign secretary. So. I've done that. I'm not going to go endlessly around in circles in my life. And I've taken a lot of new responsibilities in the business and charitable world now. So I'm, I'm not just going to abandon those things. So, let's let's um, separate it from you. Let's separate it from you just for a second. I, I accept, William, that my attempts to get you to back, back, back in politics are going to fail miserably. They are. So let's, let's, let's separate it out from you. Do you accept, however, that what we need in politics right now are people like you, people who have got perspective, who have lived a life, who have that ability to step back, be calm, offer the perspective, see the long picture, all the things that we've been talking about. Do you not think that's what we need now? Well, I will agree we could do with some more of that. I really don't specifically mean me. And I'll tell you, here this does link to our the nature of our political system because, um, you know, I mentioned how I stayed an MP even when I was down as leader of the opposition. Because I stayed an MP, I was then eight, four years later when David Cameron was elected, I could make the decision of, okay, with this man, we could actually get our act together. And I will, I will say, I'll come back and do foreign affairs, which I did with him for nearly 10 years. Um, however, if I'd left parliament, uh, which was a, another way of going about it, I couldn't then have come back. Now, in the American or French political systems. Um, it's perfectly normal to, you know, you're in a losing government, you go off and you, you're you a professor of politics at Harvard, or you go off and run a business somewhere in France, and you can then be brought straight back into the government journey, you can be brought straight back in again with all of that experience and all the thinking you've done outside. But in our system, unless you actually stay in the House of Commons, you are really putting yourself um, out of that, um, out of... There have been some exceptions, haven't there? There have been some exceptions from the Lords, haven't there? There have been some, and you can have a few people in from the Lords, of course. Um, but the Lords doesn't have that legitimacy, and you can't have that many, you can't have many senior ministers in the Lords. Whereas the President of the United States can make his entire cabinet out of people from outside Congress who he thinks are the best people to run the transportation department or the treasury or whatever it may be. Now, I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying we can switch over to a, uh, this is a more presidential system I'm talking about, but the, um, it's not quite right, our system, in the, the, the ease of coming in and out isn't right. And that makes it very difficult, because when you say to me, and again, when, I know we're not talking about me, but somebody like me, okay, you ought to make yourself available to government in the future. Yeah, but that means running for election in the constituency, you know, fighting a by-election, uh, you know, uh, looking after a constituency uh, every weekend for the, the next 10 years, as well as being a minister. In our system, that's what that involves. And that puts a lot mm -hmm. of people off. So um, we have to think long-term about how we um, allow talented people to, in an accountable way to come back into government more easily. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I take the point in terms of being an MP, but I mean, we, we, I, think, I think we need to find a way within politics more broadly to deploy experience. David was very good at it, actually. I know you'll, you'll remember when David became prime minister, one of the first things he did, actually, was bring in some truly, you know, kind of experience. Some were saying far too old, you know, uh, politicians into, you know, in, in, into, into Downing Street, um, either yeah. as advisors or as uh, or, or with more, more kind of more general advisors or with more specific roles. Yeah. And, and that, that trend, that fashion is definitely, is definitely yeah. fading. We're always looking for the new, aren't we? New invariably means young. 
We are. All, uh, young people can be brilliant. You know, I wrote a biography of William Prime Minister at 24, and he was outstanding at handling crises because he just had that natural feel for it. Although he did surround himself with some older, a lot, a lot older ministers. I, the, the one caveat I would add to what you're saying is, in Britain, we are living through a period where, because of Brexit and several changes of leadership in the Conservative Party, you know, they're, 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 people have been people have moved on more quickly than normal. Um, so, uh, you know, in more settled times, uh, you wouldn't have had this whole like a whole generation of leaders have left. Um, and True. you want to have that in more sense. So we are slightly going through an unusual period here, which wasn't the case if you had, you know, the in the 18 years of conservative government, uh, in the 80s and 90s, or even the 13 years of Labour government. Um, it wasn't the case that we, they cycled through people so quickly because they didn't have Brexit, the whole of three general elections in a row quite quickly, you know, two changes of leader. Uh, so that has given us a slightly artificial impression at the moment of how politics works. Yes, um, a balance is the answer, isn't it? Is the truth? Yes. We need a we need we need we need we need a balance in terms of age and experience and background and everything. Um, that that rolling kind of never ending crisis, though, that you you, you describe. Um, how, how do we get out of it, <laughs> William? It feels like, as you say, we've had a, a sort of decade of nonstop existential crisis although i sometimes wonder if it's just me getting old and it's always been that way <laughs> I, d- I don't know no it hasn't always been how do we way. how do we how do we break this how do we break this cycle yeah i mean for perspective there are there have been periods almost as bad if i think of the early 70s when i got interested in politics you know there were the price of oil was going up three times over there was war in the middle east uh, there was global recession there were two general elections in one year in this country. So it's not that different. And, and we came out very successfully as a country and a world from that period. So historical perspective is always useful. Um, and you just have to keep working your way through these things. There's no, uh, uh, the worst thing you can do is give in to the crisis and, uh, and uh, clutch at easy solutions and don't, that don't work. So I, can't off- I can offer that historical hope. But there's no immediate hope of this, this, this current global crisis coming to an end because there isn't really a, um, you, you can't write down a peace deal, for instance, between Ukraine and Putin that would work, that would stick. Um, there isn't one sure. available. And um, the crisis... What, what about domestic, what about, I get that completely from yeah. an international, from a sort of global perspective, but from a domestic political perspective, how do we, how do we start to break that cycle? I, 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 heard, I heard you say not that long ago that you thought that the long term, right, long term, that the two party system could collapse at some point in the next couple of decades, uh, and that we end up with a you know, a more complicated, complex coalition set up, more like, you know, we have in, in, in some other European countries. So do, do, you, do you think that both parties are, are both main parties are in, 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 a, in a sort of deep long-term crisis? No, I think they've both got immense problems. But again, we've lived through previous periods where they did so. Uh, the party system could collapse, but it's not... Um, you wouldn't bet that it would collapse. And um, the, the, British, it, it, the British political system still has the great strength that um, there are these two big families, the Conservatives and the Labour Party, with quite a lot of variety inside them, um, and that each is capable of winning a majority in Parliament. So there is an actual choice at elections for the, for the people of the country to make. Um, as long as those two parties are generating new ideas uh, for the future, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that can be a political system that works well. What is the answer? to the, Well, the answer is to really, um, I, I have a particular view about this, that the countries that succeed in the next decade will have an environment for innovation, a, a great supply of talent, the availability of capital. Um, and that everything should be geared to that. And if, if a Conservative government did all the right things on those issues, then actually a Labour government wouldn't change those things very much because they would work. 
Um, I wrote an article two weeks ago on my fantasy queen speech that was all about that. Uh, just direct everything at this goal of science, technology, science superpower, educating people. And I got such a good reaction from Conservative and Labour MPs saying that is what we should do. And so um, it is possible to, if they pursue the right policies, to break through the current crisis. The last calm period we had, it seems, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, in sort of domestic politics, was when we were in coalition. That that that, that, that period of time, albeit a fairly short one, uh, yeah. with David as prime minister. Uh, but with that sort of, you know, internal checking uh, kind of mechanism uh, that we that, that we had as a result of the uh, as a result of the coalition worked rather well, didn't it? It did work well. I was a fan of the coalition. It wasn't it wasn't what we saw at the coalition government, but um, it introduced governance into it. You know, and that goes slightly back to where we we're beginning with the um, to reflect on things, to have a structure. You know, for everybody to get their say. Um, in a coalition, you had to talk about things internally. The prime minister had to consult others. There couldn't be a um, really informal way of deciding things because we had to make sure the Lib Dems were prepared to vote for things. So um, it actually imposed quite a good discipline on, on government and um, led to... In the end, we ended up with the... Um, I, I, well, as you know, I, I was the um, I chaired the negotiations on the Conservative side for the coalition. I claimed at the time that we ended up with the with most of the Conservative manifesto and the best of the Liberal manifesto, and um, I think we did actually, and that produced a pretty solid government. Yes. So, but you can't design it. You can't go into an election saying, "Oh, our objective is to have such a finely balanced Parliament." We're going to need another path. <laughs> that would be an unusual yeah. approach. Yes. That would not be. That would not get you many votes. So uh, you have to sort Indeed. of take your chances with that. Indeed. Um, we, we touched on Ukraine at the beginning. I'd like to do so at the end, if I may. Um, your Times column today, without wishing to date this podcast, is a great read. It's an absolute masterclass in geopolitics. Um, there are plenty of, um, I should say, uh, there are plenty of uh, 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 journalists who become politicians. There aren't that many politicians who become journalists, and you've done it brilliantly. Um, you essentially set out the roadmap for, for Putin to save face, sort of claim a short-term victory, and in doing so, effectively divide the West and over the long term, then get what he wants. Um, and then you explain how it can be prevented and that, in sort of short summary, requires the leaders in the West to stick together. Uh, I suppose, taking in the conversation that we've had, that is going to be desperately difficult, isn't it? To ask all of these leaders who are facing their own issues domestically, who have different views, we're already seeing some cracks appear. Um, if you were in the old job now, how would you approach that? To, or indeed, would you see that as your role to try and be the glue you know, amongst this this disparate group of leaders in the West to stay true to the strategy? Yes, I would. Thank you. Yes, it, it's, I think that is part of the role of the British Prime Minister, um, particularly with the, all the influence Britain still has over the United States. It, this is mainly something that this is, has, has to be led by the President of the United States. You know, we've seen again in this crisis that there's only one country that can really deliver enormous power across the world and uh, from only one Western country. Um, no other country can write checks for $40 billion to Ukraine or send dozens of plane loads of military equipment every week, even though we've sent a lot proportionately, but the, uh, the United States is critical. So it's very important that President Biden leads that. And, and what I would do is more of the what happened at the beginning of the crisis, which is that London and Washington successfully called out what Putin was going to do. You know, they say, he is going to invade and he is going to use these false pretexts for, for it. Be ready for all of this. So what I'm trying to um, argue in my column is that um, you can see this. Go- we don't have the, as far as I'm aware, the intelligence that shows Putin is going to do what I described in my column. But we can see that this might very well be his next ploy. So we have to alert people to it. So watch out for this one. 
He's only trying to con you into thinking that he will come to a peace deal while he gets some uh, respite himself and to divide us about what we're going to do. So um, be ready for that. that that's, that's what I'd be doing if I was um, Prime Minister or President of the United States. You'd make a very good NATO Secretary General, will you? <laughs> oh, don't start on that. <laughs> ever ever, ever really. fancied it? No, I have gone on to uh, new things in life. And uh, if you go on to new things in life, you have to do them with uh, some energy and, and determination and, and not get sidetracked by people <laughs> saying you ought to go back into parts of your old life. <laughs> uh, forgive me. Uh, William, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your, um, for your time today. Before you go, we're going to ask you for your crisis cures. Um, three specific things, if I may, that you kind of um, rely on, lean on uh, when the going gets tough. Uh, what would they be, please? Uh, nature. Um, the Japanese like forest bathing. It, it's not a bad idea to, when in trouble, to go and walk among the trees, the plants, the wild animals. Who uh, That gives you a different perspective uh, and certainly a, a, a calmer one. Um, and then I think history, uh, I've mentioned several times in, in our discussion that uh, often you can see things in better perspective if you can remember how terrible things were before or for a previous generation. Mm -hmm. Don't feel so sorry for yourself when you think about, um, you know, people in the 20 years old in 1940 being expected to go off to war. Um, and um, so history is very important. And ex to me, exercise is very important. Um, it is, like I always used to say to my officials at the front office, I can do without sleep. Uh, and when, you, when we put together this week's plan, I, I can do without food, but I can't do without my exercise. I have to have a run or a swim or something in the morning. When I'm in big trouble, I need even more of that. Because I think that gives you an energy and a self-confidence and, again, a sense of perspective and some time to think when um, people can't bother you. So um, nature, history and exercise are my three tips. That's wonderful. William, thank you so much for joining us today. That was a, uh, a wonderful conversation. It's great to see you again. And, uh, and, just, and thank you for sharing your perspective. Thank you very much, Andy. Great pleasure. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. And if you hit subscribe, wherever you download your podcast from, you'll find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Our handle is at Crisis What Crisis Podcast. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>